Hello, and welcome back to the Parenting and Pregnancy Podcast, where I sit down with experts, parents, and other individuals discussing things relevant to you during your pregnancy, childbirth, parenting, and beyond. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, consider subscribing so you don't miss any new episodes. This week, I had a really great conversation with Rihanna Wickett. Rihanna graduated from the University of South Dakota with a doctorate of physical therapy. She is also a certified strength and conditioning specialist through the National Strength and Conditioning Association, level one certified in blood flow restriction training, and a previous EMT. While at USD, Dr. Wickett researched the effects of various treatments, including manual therapy and exercise on trigger points, which is a common cause of pain within the short shoulder girdle. She has also completed the Otago Exercise Program, Falls Prevention Training, and Evidence-Based Fall Prevention Certification. Her clinical studies emphasizes women's health, neurological and vestibular conditions, and orthopedics. She graduated with a Bachelor's of Science in Pre-Medicine from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. Rihanna was a ballet dancer for almost 20 years, which allows her to treat performing arts athletes with special insight into the unique skill set required of these athletes. She is passionate about providing each patient individualized care backed by the latest research and educating patients about their conditions to make lifelong changes. She has also completed continuing education in women's health physical therapy to treat a wide range of conditions relating to pelvic floor health throughout the lifespan, including pre- and postnatal conditions, incontinence, prolapse, sexual dysfunction, and pelvic pain. In her free time, Rihanna enjoys spending time out outdoors with her family, friends, and dog Zippy. In this episode, Dr. Wickett and I were really focused on pelvic floor health. We discussed what a pelvic floor is, how to use a pelvic floor. We discussed all of the other systems in the body that the pelvic floor impacts. Symptoms that might indicate that pelvic floor health needs to be addressed. How pelvic floor healing works. And we also discussed some of the myths associated with pelvic floor health. This was one of my favorite conversations I've had so far for this podcast. I really enjoyed it and I hope you too. And I hope you will too. So without further ado, let's get into it. All right, Rihanna, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Uh, Well, it is my pleasure. I'm really excited to learn more about pelvic floor health. Um, It's not something I know um, nearly as much about as I'd like to, so I'm happy to sit down with an expert. Absolutely. I'm happy to share. It's not something that a lot of people know much about, actually. Exactly. And and I think we know some, some, uh, you know, I've heard of Kegels and, and unfortunately, I think the word Kegels and pelvic floor is sometimes the only, um, only thing some people know about. Yeah. And that's the hardest part too, because people will be told just go retrain your pelvic floor or go do a whole bunch of Kegels. And oftentimes people have no idea or think that they have an idea and end up doing it incorrectly. Um, so it's, it's actually really important to know what you're doing and to know that you're doing it correctly in order to have the best results. Is there harm in doing it incorrectly? Yeah. If you're doing something incorrectly, you can actually make things worse. So say you're maybe having incontinence, um, and you're told, okay, just do a whole bunch of Kegels and maybe you are ending up bearing down and we can get into more of what that would be. Um, but if you're doing something incorrectly, then you're, you're training the muscles improperly and, um, I won't say harm, but you're definitely not going to be helping yourself out. Okay. Could make things a little bit worse. Could make things worse. Well, then let's go to the very basic of pelvic floor health. Start by just telling us what is a pelvic floor for those who yeah. have no clue. Absolutely. Most people look at me and kind of say a, a pelvic what? Um, so it's basically just a group of muscles and it's at um, the base of, of your pelvis and Um, it holds up your bladder, your rectum, the rest of your organs, but it also controls those organs. So 
It allows you to have a bowel movement, allows you um, your urinary functions, um, sexual functions, and it plays a really, really important role in your stability um, so that you don't have back pain, um, hip pain, anything like that. So it's just a group of muscles, just like any other muscle in your body, um, but they're really important in your, in your stability. Okay, so this is something that can have an impact on your bladder functions, your bowel functions, reproductive functions, and just general feelings of of comfort and wellness. Absolutely, you nailed it. So sounds like pretty important muscle group. Um, So I see how pelvic floor health is important. Can you maybe tell us a little bit more of the specifics of why pelvic floor health is so important? I mean, it it sounds like it, it involves a lot but why why isn't this like all our other muscles where it just kind of does what we want it to that's the hardest part so if you think about like your bicep you can do a bicep curl and you see your bicep working um and and can focus on that or somebody can look at you from across the room and say you're not doing that correctly um and it's something that people are comfortable talking about um whereas the pelvic floor number one people it's important to to talk about it and to know about it because Um, it it needs to be more of a comfortable topic, um, so that more people can be helped, but it's extremely important, whether it's the stability related, just feeling that you don't have, um, like the back pain or hip pain, um, having those proper control, the proper control of all of those functions that you had mentioned. Um, but it's also really important because people don't know one that it's there and two, how to use it properly because it's challenging to see. So it's kind of like an interesting cycle of, well, I don't really know how to use it. And then it just gets weaker. So then you might have pain or incontinence, um, a lack of sexual health, um, all the above. Um, And people generally, when I talk to a group of women, um, we will talk about pelvic floor concerns and they'll say, well, I don't have any concerns. And then one person pipes up and says, well, you know, I wear a a thin pad or I, I have a little bit of leaking after my second child. And then immediately everyone else in the room waves their hand and says, oh, that's what we're talking about. I have that too. Um, So it's a really common problem and people might just not know that it's contributing to other things such as back pain or your constipation. Um, and, and people just don't know that there's some way that they can be helped. I, yeah, I had no idea. I mean, this is news to me, even that it um, could influence back pain and constipation. I knew about incontinence, but um, it goes to show and just how little we do talk about it. And it's interesting that you pointed out how it's not a muscle we can see and we don't necessarily think about working it. And, and I guess that makes sense why this is a muscle group that maybe does end up weaker because we don't see it and we don't consciously work it. Right. Well, and that's the hard part too, because it's almost impossible like that bicep curl analogy. You know, I can demonstrate something like that and somebody can watch that and say, okay, I know what I'm doing. Um, but with pelvic floor therapy, we have to come up with other tools. So we use other things, um, other tools like biofeedback, internal work, um, to be able to show somebody how to use those muscles properly. Um, because that's one of the hardest parts to get over is how do I even use this correctly? So even in physical therapy, you have to use some other tools beyond just. Yep. Absolutely. So in what people think of traditional physical therapy, you'll use like weights and bands and exercise equipment. Um, so for your pelvic floor, we talk a lot more about like breathing, um, and controlling that because your diaphragm sits above your pelvic floor, above the organs, um, and should work together with your pelvic floor. Um, so we talk a ton about breathing. Um, we can use devices such as like a biofeedback unit, um, whether those are electrodes placed on the skin or your abdominals or an internal sensor for females, um, or males and females, if it's a rectal sensor and, um, that just helps somebody look at a computer screen and say, okay, this is when my muscles contracting, I know exactly what I'm doing or, um, not doing appropriately. 
So a biofeedback uh, device, correct me if I'm wrong here, a biofeedback device is a piece of technology that can allow you to visualize what the muscles are doing. Is that correct? Basically, yes. So you can have a sensor, like I said, either electrodes on the skin, or it can be in an internal sensor placed. And that translates the basically like the force production of the muscles onto a computer screen. That way somebody can look at the computer screen as they're contracting their muscles um, and know if they're doing it correctly or not. Um, and I can look from the outside and say, okay, that was a good contraction or not so good. Let's, let's try that again. Okay. So it sounds like a really useful tool. Extremely useful. And sometimes it can help people, um, just with that visual feedback, um, help correct the muscles, uh, connecting that mind body, um, awareness a lot faster. Okay. That is a really helpful tool. I had never heard of that in the context of, of pelvic floor physical therapy. Yeah, absolutely. It can be extremely helpful. Um, some of the other things that we can do are like the internal exams. Um, but the biofeedback can be a really useful visual feedback as well, just because the, the patient can look at that on a computer screen, um, and see what their muscles are doing. Okay. Um, so I'm backtracking here a little bit, but I kind of want to go back to what you were talking about with sitting and talking to women because men and women both have a pelvic floor, correct? Absolutely. And that's one of the biggest things that I, um, tell people a lot of times is most men will say, oh, that's for, that's for females after they give birth. Um, and not necessarily because men have a pelvic floor too. Um, it just works a little bit differently. There's just a few different muscles. Um, but it's absolutely for, for both women, obviously we have more hormone changes. We have, we give birth, uh, we are shaped differently. So we just are at a little bit more of a, of an impact or risk with pelvic floor concerns. Okay. And women talk about it more. Yeah. I think, I think sometimes women are a little more comfortable broaching those, um, more uncomfortable topics. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's kind of one of the things that my goal recently has been is making it more of a comfortable topic, knowing if you know the anatomy and you know, the functions, um, why, why aren't we talking about it? Because it can make such a big impact for people, um, in just their overall quality of life. That is I love that because I think even in my line of work um, as a postpartum doula and lactation consultant, childbirth educator, there's a lot of, of those things that are really, I mean, taboo to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. And and it negatively impacts people's well-being when we aren't comfortable having those discussions. So I really love that. Absolutely. Um, so maybe sometime I'll have you back and we can talk about pelvic floor in men. That would be a really interesting discussion, but it's a I really, whole new topic. Yeah. That sounds like a whole, and I would be, I'd be coming from a blank slate there. Um, but I really want to focus today on how, uh, pregnancy and childbirth, um, and just some of those, um, bodily stressors we go through as women can impact uh, the pelvic floor. Can you share that, share a little bit about that with us? Absolutely. So as you're pregnant for those extended months, um, as the baby grows and your body is changing and you have hormone changes, um, you've got the weight of the growing baby, the weight of the increased blood flow, um, the placenta and everything that supports baby, um, weighing down on the pelvic floor, um, along with the hormone changes specifically relax in, which will basically it, that's what helps you be able to give birth and have your body, um, form itself to allow for the birthing process. Um, but the, the growing weight onto the pelvic floor and the changes in the, in the physics, basically, um, your muscles can get longer. Um, and if, 
if that, if your body can't compensate for that, you can end up, especially going through childbirth, um, whether it's, it's tearing or just the trauma, or if any devices have to be used. Um, and even people will say, you know, I had a C-section, so that doesn't impact me, but it absolutely does. You went through that time period growing a child inside of you. Um, and so your pelvic floor has to support that against gravity. Um, and you can have a lot of weaknesses, you can also have tightness in there. So kind of think about it like your neck muscles. If you have been working on the computer for an extended period of time um, in an awkward position that maybe your muscles aren't used to, you get trigger points and you get a sore neck. Your pelvic floor can do that too. So you get trigger points there as well. So not only can you have the weakness um, during while, while you're pregnant or even in the postpartum phase, um, causing maybe the weakness causing incontinence. You can also have the trigger points that can cause pain as well. Um, the trigger points can cause pain and incontinence. Um, so when we talk about quality of life as a new mom, um, whether it's, you're a first time mom or you're a new mom again, your quality of life is extremely important. Um, so when we add all of the hormone changes, the body changes, the sleep changes, um, and then possibly, you know, emotions going along with those hormones. It's a really big deal. If somebody has pelvic floor pain or back pain, um, incontinence or returning to sexual functions, um, if that is impacted, the quality of life is, is dramatically impacted. So pelvic floor health. Well, there's so much to unpack there because first of all, it's fascinating to me that your muscles can actually get longer. Um, Your pelvic floor muscles actually can get longer during pregnancy. I could see how that could cause some problems. And it's, yeah, it's, it's more rather than like a true lengthening, it's more of the pressure of, of everything weighing down. um, And then it will actually weaken, weaken those muscles if you're not focused on, on using them properly. Okay. That is really interesting. And then it, and then to hear how all of those changes can really impact the quality of life after, after the fact. Um, and that's something, part of the reason I wanted to have you on so badly on my podcast is being a postpartum doula. I hear about a lot of those problems, but in the context of just, you know, along with the hormone changes, along with everything else, you just have to deal with this incontinence. I can't jump on the trampoline with my kid anymore. Um, yeah, absolutely. My dog. I think, yeah, here. I think the, the long standing kind of stereotype is people being told, well, you, you just went through childbirth or, you know, you're pregnant. So those things happen, or you've had three kids. So those things happen. Just, that's just what happens. You deal with it. Um, that is something that I'm very passionate about that. And I know that for you, for you as well, being able to pass on those words that yes, it's common, but it's not normal that you should have to live with incontinence or pain, um, or the worry of, did I bring my extra set of clothes today? Just in case I have an issue. Yeah, that is so true. I had a question I was going to ask you and I lost it. Um, so, um, is it possible to go through pregnancy and that postpartum period without incontinence? Is that absolutely? Yep. Absolutely. So some people, um, they go through that entire phase and their muscles happen to work completely as they should. Um, and they never experience it. And, and that's, that's wonderful. I'm excited for those people. Um, that's, you know, a sign of really good, healthy muscles. And I, I wish that for everybody, but unfortunately that's not always the case. Um, even, you know, athletes that are extremely well in tune with their body, um, and working most muscle groups at, throughout pregnancy, they can come into these issues as well. So it's not, um, specific to one type of person. 
Um, oftentimes people that maybe are going through a, a really good, well rounded program for, for exercise, say while they're pregnant, um, they might run into these, these concerns as well, just because they have something going on with their pelvic floor that they don't know how to fix. Um, and just that jumping impact or, um, the hormones change for them, but yeah, people can absolutely have no problem throughout, uh, pregnancy and postpartum. I think that is so interesting to hear because I, th I think a lot of women think mm -hmm. that you, that comes with pregnancy. So it's really great to hear. It's really optimistic to hear that that is not necessarily, it doesn't have to be a part of it. And Absolutely. if it is, we can do something about it. And the nicest thing, you know, recently I've had a few patients that are in the, you know, the first or very beginning of the second trimester and come in and have maybe a little bit of pelvic floor concerns and, or they just want to learn more and, and make sure that they don't have pain or incontinence or anything later on. Um, and we do a little bit of education and they wind up going through the rest of their pregnancy and we get to chit chat, but they don't actually need my services then because they do just fine. Um, so even some education early on can be extremely beneficial in preventing those issues. Okay. So there's things that there's some preventative things that we can do ahead of, ahead of these problems arising to prevent them from ever occurring. Is that correct? Yep, absolutely. So generally I try to get people, um, to understand basically what a pelvic floor is, um, to know possibly if they're doing the Kegels correctly or the pelvic floor contractions. Um, and we really talk about breathing and your abdominal control and your, your hip strength as well, because that all plays a role. They're all very interconnected. So if people go into it with a little bit of an understanding, we can address issues before they're actually an issue. Okay. Um, and what are some of the, if someone is having issues or isn't sure if they're having issues, we touched on this a little bit, but beyond just incontinence, what are some of the symptoms that indicate maybe there's some work to do with our pelvic floor muscles? Yeah. Even, you know, especially early on, um, in pregnancy, constipation is very common. Um, and that may or may not indicate that we should look at the pelvic floor, but it could be something that we don't want the constipation to further impact, um, your, your pelvic floor, you know, where people end up having to bear down to have a bowel movement, um, any sort of hip pain or back pain, um, abdominal weakness that can also be an indicator that we should look at the pelvic floor as well. Um, and making sure that it's, it's working appropriately, um, as far as strength and mobility. Um, usually, usually it's the pain or, you can have um, pain with intercourse. Any of that can be a really strong indicator that we should at least evaluate. Okay. So constipation, um, back and hip pain, that incontinence, like we discussed, um, and just really weak abdominal muscles. Those are all signs that maybe it's worth contacting a pelvic floor physical therapist. Absolutely. Well, that's really helpful to know. And so say that's identified or somebody is even just curious or they're trying to become pregnant or just become pregnant. They want to do some of that preventative stuff. Um, what, what can you do in your practice with patients to improve pelvic floor health? I know we talked about some of that biofeedback um, and Kegels, but can you get, get specific with some of, some of those treatment options? Absolutely. So it depends on each person's situation. Um, but I like to look basically head to toe at, at their strength and their mobility. Um, so looking at core strength, hip strength, glutes, your legs, and then how are you breathing? Are you breathing appropriately? Or are we doing really shallow chest breathing just because that that your diaphragm should work really closely together with that pelvic floor. Um, and so depending on the person, I like to do an internal exam if it's warranted before we go into the biofeedback training, um, just because that gives us even a little bit more, 
um, information as far as what the pelvic floor is doing or not doing. And any tightness, um, the, the biofeedback doesn't give us the ability to find those trigger points in the pelvic floor and, and treat them um, as quickly and appropriately as we should. Um, in addition to that, having somebody work on a home program of breathing, maybe it's relaxation that they need to do. Um, and then the, the correct strength for them, um, whether that's abdominal leg or hip strength. Um, so a full exam head to toe is generally what I like to start with. And that lets you kind of gauge all of those things like you're talking about the trigger points. Um, I guess it would make sense that other muscles in the area work together because this kind of seems how seems to be how all muscles work is they all work together. Um, uh, is maybe this is a a wrong a weird question, but. We hear a lot There's about no weird questions board. in public oh. health. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, but pelvic floor weakness, we talk a lot about that, but you're talking about relaxation and things like that. It makes me wonder, is there ever an issue where actually pelvic floor muscles are too tight? Absolutely. Absolutely. So a lot of times people will come to me with with incontinence, whether that is directly postpartum or they've had it for 20 years after they had a couple of children, um, and they were just told to deal with it. So sometimes the pelvic floor, just like any other muscle, it can get weak, but you can also have tightness. So if the pelvic floor is too tight, um, you won't allow, um, the, the sphincters, to work appropriately. So you won't allow the opening for, uh, the rectum and, um, your urinary functions. They won't allow that to open and close appropriately if the muscle is too tight. Um, so think of it kind of like a dynamic muscle, the pelvic floor should move up and down as you're breathing and moving. And if it's too tight, then it can't do that appropriately. So it sounds like you can have just as many issues with too tight of pelvic floor muscles as was too weak. Bingo. So that's part of the reason that when people are just told, oh, you have maybe some incontinence um, or some sort of pelvic floor issue, just do a whole bunch of Kegels. Um, that can actually make it worse because sometimes someone could present with incontinence and have a very weak pelvic floor. They could present with incontinence and have too tight of a pelvic floor. So if we tell somebody that has too tight of a pelvic floor, just do a bunch of Kegels, you can actually make the problem worse. Um, so we need to find out what, what is the, um, where are the issues coming from? Um, is it too tight or is it too weak or is it a mixture of both? And oftentimes it's that. Well, that is, that makes a lot of sense because sometimes I hear women, they say, well, I, I do Kegels every day. I do Kegels all the time and I must be doing them wrong. And maybe they are yep. doing it wrong, but it, that's interesting to hear that. Well, maybe that's actually making the problem worse. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Maybe it would be a good idea to, to seek out a professional. That's my best advice for people. Um, if you know, most people, because it's almost a taboo topic, unless their best friend has gone through pelvic floor therapy, um, it's not the first thing that people want to jump on. Um, but if they're not finding the improvements that they need to, the best idea is to just get evaluated by a therapist that's trained in those muscles. Um, a lot of times it can be a couple sessions of some simple education and people find significant benefit. Okay. So when, if someone wants to reach out to you or if they're not in the area, another pelvic floor physical therapist, they're not necessarily committing to a year long program with no. exercises and everything else. Sometimes it's much simpler than that. Absolutely. So the biggest, uh, you know, myth around physical therapy is that as soon as you even sign on, you are committing to three times a week for 12 weeks, maybe. Uh, and that's not entirely true. A lot of times people can, um, have one or two sessions and all they need is some education or to know how to do something properly. And then they, they go and do it on their own and they find huge benefit just, um, doing it as a home program. 
Well, that is also, I think, really helpful to know because if you are one of those new moms, um, you don't necessarily have three days a week for 12 weeks to come in for no. pelvic floor physical therapy. And I worry sometimes um, as women, we might choose not to seek out treatment because of that. So that is really good to know. Absolutely. Um, and the biggest thing that, that I always tell new moms is, you know, whatever we've got time for in, in your life, that's better. We can start there. Something is better than doing nothing about it. So at least if I can educate you and provide you with a few of the tools and tidbits that you might need, um, you can practice that on your own, um, knowing that you're maybe doing it correctly. Well, it's certainly not going to get better magically on its own, right? No, so no, not this- generally. I like what you said there. Something is better than nothing. We'll just make it work with what you can do. Um, So I would love to kind of before we get into maybe what you do specifically and um, and how people can find out more about you and 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 what you do. I'd love to debunk some of those common myths about pelvic floor health. We did, I think, talk about a handful of them. But are there any others that you can think of that you really want to take this opportunity to share the word about? Um, I know that we already talked about one of my favorites that men absolutely have a pelvic floor also. Um, And the other, just the biggest one is that just because you have some sort of public health concern right now, or you have for five years or 10 years, that doesn't mean that you will always have it. Um, most people say, well, my mom had it, my grandma had it. It's just something I have to live with now. And that's absolutely not the, not the case. Um, there's a lot that we can do about it. Um, and I guess one of the biggest things that people will tell me after maybe their first session of pelvic floor therapy, um, they always say that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be, um, because it is a taboo topic. People get a little bit weirded out about it. And they always say, you know, you made me feel comfortable and, um, that was a lot more comfortable than, than I thought it might be, um, talking about my pelvic floor. And I like that you brought that up because I think some people who hear, um, internal, uh, sensors and, and different yeah. things like that, that a rectal sensor, that doesn't sound very <laughs> comfortable. Um, is that necessarily something that needs to happen for everybody? Absolutely not. Um, generally we go with whatever the patient is most comfortable with. If you're the most comfortable assessing breathing and maybe doing some hip strengthening, um, meaning like with an exercise band, um, in a seated position or standing, that's where we start. Um, when you talk about pelvic health, it's a little bit of a delicate topic. So you go with whatever the patient is comfortable with. If you're not comfortable with an internal exam, then you get to know me And, um, we work on what we can for the time being. Well, that is great. I don't want anyone thinking that if they call Rihanna, they are going to have a (laughs) rectal sensor put in. They will not. So they will not. (laughs) Well, great. Um, any other myths that you can think of that you want to speak to? I think those are, are, are the biggest ones. Just knowing that, um, if you have an issue, you won't always have an issue with the pelvic floor. Um, there are definitely things that, that we can help with. Well, great. Um, and now can you tell us a little bit more about what services you offer specifically? Um, for those listening, we are both located in the Black Hills region of South Dakota um, in Rapid City specifically. Um, but what exactly do you do in your practice? Absolutely. So our practice is a general practice, rural practice. Um, so within our clinic, we can treat treat anything from um, balance or vestibular issues um, and falls to the the regular strengthening or pre op and post op that that people generally think about. Um, but with my practice of women's health, we look at for women anywhere throughout the lifespan, whether it's um, pelvic health or, um, strengthening, starting with puberty all the way through menopause and and knowing that the the hormone changes and life changes, um, will impact each woman differently. Um, so I use tools such as the exams that we've talked about, the biofeedback, um, breathing techniques, um, and strengthening and just overall movement patterns. Um, a lot of times, 
all we have to even start talking about when a female feels better is the mental aspect of things because, um, the, the mind and body are so connected. So we, we start with where the patient needs. Um, I've had patients that come from anywhere from, I just had a child and I need to get back to running my 5k or somebody that's had physical trauma. Um, we teach anywhere in between. So not even just pelvic floor health, you're doing all women's health and your clinic does a lot of basically general physical. Therapy. Yep. Anything that you can think about. If somebody's not moving as well as they want to, they're not feeling as well as they want to, we treat it all. Okay. Well, that maybe I'll have to have you come back and we'll talk about something else sometime then related to, um, to those feelings of, of just not being yourself in your body or having that mobility that, that you desire. Absolutely. Um, all right. How can people find you um, on your website or your social media accounts if they want to learn more? Yep, absolutely. So our website is elevate performance SD for South Dakota.com. And then our social media for, um, Facebook and Instagram is at elevate performance SD. And then Twitter is elevate SODAC, um, S O D A K. So they can contact us via any of those or, um, call the clinic, visit our website and learn a little bit more about us. Okay. And I will have all of those, um, accounts and websites and phone numbers and things in the description below. Um, if anybody wants to take a look at those. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I could probably chat with you for hours if we had the time about this, but unfortunately we don't. Absolutely. It's something that I'm extremely passionate about. So generally if women just have any questions, um, about if I can possibly help them, I would absolutely love to hear from them. Well, great. Uh, hopefully, Hopefully this has wrote, um, brought up some awareness to some of these, um, to some things about pelvic floor health that, that uh, women didn't know before. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. All right. We're going to end it here. Thanks, guys. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Rihanna Wickett. I know I really enjoyed having the conversation with her. If you want to learn more about her, I'll link all of her um, contact information down below in the show notes. If you enjoyed this episode, consider liking this episode and subscribing in whatever platform that you use so that you don't miss any new episodes. Thank you so much for listening. I'll catch you guys in the next one.